Welcome to another episode of the Gay Bar Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and today's special guest is Jack Curtis Dabowski, a prolific composer, author, filmmaker, and educator. His feature documentary film, Submerged Square Spaces, is a study of gay history through architecture and urban archaeology. Welcome, Jack. Uh, your movie, Submerged Queer Spaces, explores the evolution of San Francisco's legendary gay neighborhoods and the bars they housed. What inspired that film? Um, I think that a, a number of things inspired the film. Uh, one was that um, at the time that we started filming, which was uh, 2010, we had started to see a lot of uh, gentrification in the city and a lot of changes in the city. So um, there was a lot of places that were closing. And um, one of the famous bars even closed during the filming of Submerged Queer Spaces, which is uh, the Eagle closed um, during the filming of Submerged Queer Spaces. And so there's an interview with Doug, one of the bartenders there about that. Um, so it was largely a confluence of timing and also that um, there was, uh, there is a really great archive in um, San Francisco, which had a lot of archival photographs. So we were able to get a structure for the film around these archival photographs and then look and see what the spaces were like at the time of filming, which as I said, is now over 10 years ago or yeah over 10 years ago now. Yeah, I saw how you, um, how you did that and you took the modern footage from different neighborhoods and kind of overlaid the imagery of what it used to be, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago um, so that people could kind of not only see the architectural similarities and identify that, yes, this is what it was, but also to kind of bring it, um, a little bit better to light because they can still see what was in the video that you were shooting. I mean, those buildings are still there for them or were there at that time. And then you put in this overlay of something from 30 or 40 years ago, and it kind of connects it all in your head. It, it was a really interesting take on how to do that, you know, to focus on the architectural um, aspect of, of recording the history. Yeah, so the film really looks at architecture a lot. And um, so the film is something of a uh, very uh, experimental documentary. And we really were looking at a lot of the architecture and we tried to do these things that are called match cuts where we have an archival photograph and then we have footage that we shot and to lay them together so you can see where the building was or what it looked like and of course at the time we were doing this and on the budget that we were doing it these match cuts are very primitive and i'm sure we could do them better today but you still get the idea of you see an archival picture of what the building was like or what was there and then how it is now what was really interesting to us i think was that a lot of the addresses had sort of changed because it turns out that buildings don't necessarily have fixed addresses. So you can change the address of a building as long as it's still an odd number or even number for that side of the street in California. And so we would look at these pictures and go, wait, where did this building go? That number is no longer there. And the number would be a, a few digits off, but the building would still be there. And some of the things were very interesting. Like I think at, at the Gold Coast, um, there was a hatch that had been bricked over. Uh, there's a lot of buildings where the planters had been removed or changed. So in San Francisco, there's a lot of this thing where there are these brick planters outside the buildings and a lot of those have been removed or shortened. Sometimes the planters were used to hide the entrance of the building or to make the building more discreet, to make a bar more discreet. And those had been torn down. Um, so there's a lot of interesting changes and some of the changes, you know, we looked at the blue and gold, which was an old bathhouse in the Tenderloin and, um, and we found it 
and it had become something else. And we saw that there's remnants of the tile that used to be on the outside of the building. So it, it sort of became this interesting journey of urban archaeology. And you, um, one thing that was interesting for me, I have never been to San Francisco. And um, obviously, you have spent a lot of time there. But what was interesting to me is the way that you grouped the presentation, you basically went by neighborhood. You went by area of town. So you started off with North Beach and you moved through Tenderloin, Soma, Castro, Valencia, so that people could identify a single neighborhood instead of just jumping around randomly from one place to another. You actually kind of grouped it into neighborhoods so we could understand what that entire you know, block or group of blocks was like in the past. Yeah, so when, you know, when we started this film, we were sort of uh, began with this wealth of information that we had from the archives about all these bars and restaurants and bathhouses and queer spaces and photographs of many of them. Some of them we didn't have photographs and we were kind of looking at all this information and figuring out how are we gonna organize this? And it seemed logical to do it by neighborhood um, for a number of reasons, but there's a certain logic to the order that these neighborhoods are presented. So we're starting with basically the oldest neighborhoods and the oldest queer spaces and slowly progressing to the newer neighborhoods and newer queer spaces. So uh, for example, South of Market um, was man-made, it's landfill. So South of Market originally was docks with boats and it was filled in with landfill and became a neighborhood that originally wasn't there. And other areas like the Polk and the Castro, even though people think of them as being quintessentially San Franciscan, those are neighborhoods that the gays and lesbians and queer people went to later. Um, we start with, um, with North Beach, which is one of the oldest uh, neighborhoods in San Francisco. And they have places uh, dating back to the 1850s that were, um, possibly uh, gay places. Uh, there's a bar there called the Gold Coast we looked at. That's one of the oldest places um, in San Francisco for queer people. So a lot of the places we're looking at in, in that area, it's sort of like a historical thing. Whereas when we start getting to Union Square and the Tenderloin, we have places like the Old Crow on Market Street, which was a gay bar. So that dates from the 1930s. So we have, um, starting about the 1930s, bars that were not a bar that was frequented by gay people, but bars that were actually gay bars that were um, meant for the queer community. Um, and then we have, of course, Union Square, and uh, Jerry Fabian takes us through Union Square, which was at the time, a cruising area and um, people today might find, might find that unusual. Like how can you have the big park in downtown be a cruising area? But the same thing happened in, for example, Los Angeles when Pershing Square was a cruising area, which uh, John Retchie talks about in his book, City of Night. So Pershing Square and Union Square in San Francisco are sort of analogous where um, mid-century they are they are gay cruising areas right and a lot of people don't realize you know to your first point of course in the in the middle of the 19th century um for the most part anywhere in the country there wasn't anything that was a blatant gay bar you know all of the gay gathering spaces for the most part were either clandestine or underground or word of mouth or just kind of evolved by nature of their location and their patrons. They didn't advertise. They didn't have a big sign outside that said, hey, we're a gay bar. But there are numerous places around the country, especially in the larger cities that date back to the 1850s that were known and documented through um, 
kind of subtle remarks in the media at the time, you know, a newspaper article that made a backhanded comment suggesting that that was a gay place or whatever. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that those places existed that long ago. It just wasn't until really um, after prohibition that we started to identify them a little bit more openly. Um, and, and like you said, with the old crow, you started to see places that were designed to be gay bars. Um, as for the, the public spaces, you know, you mentioned one in Los Angeles and a couple in San Francisco, but that was the case in a lot of cities as well. Um, I know when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, right across the street from Vanderbilt University, probably at the time, the most well-known park in Nashville was Centennial Park, which is known for its uh, life-size reproduction of the Greek Parthenon that sits in the middle of the park, was a very well-known gay cruising spot. Uh, certain area, certain pathway along there was very common for gay men to go and meet on the weekends and the evenings, whatever, to connect. Uh, when I moved to Atlanta, we had the same situation in Piedmont Park, uh, which is in the heart of Midtown, which, of course, in Atlanta is, has been known as the, the Gayborhood. And um, the cruising area there um, is gone now, but it is now the home of the Fuqua Conservatory, which has a huge tropical plant botanical garden space right there. Um, so those, those kind of spaces, like you said, with Union Square, were one of the most common places to actually meet up with guys outside of a bar. Now, how would you differentiate the, um, the nature of the bars, you know, as you progress through time in the movie, going from North Beach to Tenderloin to Market? Um, how, how would you kind of encapsulate that experience, how, how different they were, how much the same they were? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, we used a variety of sources. So there was a, there was a database at the archive there that has a lot of uh, period quotes about these spaces. And so they appear in the film. So we have period descriptions of what the bars were like or what crowd frequented those bars. And then we also have interviews with people who went to those bars. So we got a number of, you know, really fun, interesting perspectives. Uh, there's a very famous uh, women's bar in the Castro called Scott's Pit, uh, which is on Scott Street. And it's not there anymore, but uh, we had a number of stories about uh, Scott's Pit, which were all very funny. Um, uh, uh, Guy Clark talks about going to Scott's Pit and being told, what's a woman's bar? And Scott, uh, excuse me, Guy Clark says, oh, I don't mind. That's great. And they said, no, it's a women's bar. You have to leave. <laughs> so uh, he sort of misunderstood that. Um, they were trying to keep it as a women's space. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, subcultures um, that inhabit these different bars. Uh, one of the things that uh, you mentioned, Tennessee and the South and other places in the middle of the country, one of the things that I noticed when I was traveling is that in a lot of places, um, bars might be very inclusive because if a, if a small town only has one bar, everybody goes there. But in San Francisco, even in the mid-century, um, things had really splintered and there were these different crowds that appealed to different, um, different bars that appealed to different crowds. So you would have bars that were for a certain age range or for a, a certain background or things like that. Um, you know, I think uh, Jim Van Busker talks about the rendezvous and how this was a sweater bar and this was for um, younger guys that wanted to dance, whereas other bars were for old for an older crowd, or there was a lot of um, demographic variation. Uh, Jim Forat talks about a bar in the Lower Haight that was um, primarily for the African-American community. I think 
Bly's bounty or something like that. But um, just that there was a lot of demographic splintering in a lot of these bars. And there was also in the in the 60s, this big hippie scene, and there were a lot of gay hippies. And the stud originally had a lot of tie dye and a lot of uh, heads and uh, gay hippies. Um, and the stud was also uh, welcoming to women, whereas other bars were not as welcoming to women. So in San Francisco, there's a lot of variables and there's there were a lot of spaces, bars and restaurants and cruising areas. And we tried to represent as many as we could and as many different communities as we could. So um, that's one of the interesting things about, about uh, San Francisco's uh, queer scene and bar scene, even dating back to the early mid centuries, the amount of variation you have there. Yeah, and you did a great job kind of, you know, showing that all off. I was not sure what to expect the first time I watched the movie. And I wasn't sure how in depth it would be or how many, you know, bars or neighborhoods would be explored. And I was quite surprised to see the number of places that you you mentioned and talked about in a movie that's only an hour and a half long. I mean, I every time I turned around, I was like, oh, wait, there's another bar. There's another bar, you know, and there's three bars that were all at the same place. Um, it was it was very informative to me, of course, having been researching the gay bars from around the country. I've seen this before where one storefront for some reason becomes you know rainbow blessed or something and becomes a, a succession of gay bars for 40 years with 12 different names and i was seeing the same thing in your story where a lot of these bars you know change from a gay bar to a lesbian bar to a leather bar to a whatever but at the same address um which was was really interesting to me to see that the depth that you went to with that and not just saying, well, here's half a dozen bars in San Francisco. Isn't that pretty? You really, you really dug into it. I, I think that one of the things that happened historically was that bar owners did not necessarily own the building. And I think that a lot of building owners, especially in the mid century, perhaps didn't want to rent to people who were going to run a gay bar. So I think that may be one reason why you see a gay bar being succeeded by another gay bar, being succeeded by a lesbian bar, being su succeeded by another gay bar, is because those landlords were already shown to be willing to rent to a gay establishment. I suspect that may be one reason. I, I think another reason is also because um, it was already a familiar space. So if the bar changed hands, people were already familiar with that location. Um, one of the interesting things in the, is in the movie is some of these areas that were very densely populated by gay establishments, such as uh, the Polk. And um, we even filmed this sequence of us driving this rental car up and down Polk Street at 4.30 in the morning so, so we wouldn't have to stop at every light. Um, and you can just see how many establishments there were on Polk Street. It's, it's pretty amazing. So a, a lot of these neighborhoods did become gay neighborhoods like the Polk and, and later the Castro. The, the Castro is like the, the late arrival, which people don't realize. Um, all these other neighborhoods had queer establishments long before uh, uh, the Castro, like uh, the Tenderloin and Polk Street, and then the Castro was the latecomer. Yeah, and I think we see that kind of evolution in a lot of cities where what may have originally been where the gay bars were does not end up being what is now known as gay central. Um, in your situation with San Francisco, I think part of that, and maybe a big part of that, had to do with um, Milk, Harvey Milk, because he kind of put San Francisco on the map nationally as a gay city you know, his politics and the, and all the talk about his, his career and his, his death and everything, I think kind of focus people's eyes on the Castro. And I think that may have been part of the turning point of what kind of helped keep that 
that area so well identified? Well, uh, San, San Francisco is has these uh, supervisors, so they're all split into districts. So he represented, I I, I believe he represented a gay district. Um, I don't think it was a citywide election. It was he had a camera store on Castro Street, and Castro was already um, a gay neighborhood. But I, I think in the case of San Francisco, it goes back much farther than that because San Francisco was a naval town and a military town and it had a naval base and being a town where sailors were and where sailors often had leave, this is something you see in a lot of naval towns where um, sailors were able to express themselves um, sexually and when they're um, on shore leave, they go out and have some adventures. And this leads to a lot of uh, bars of ill repute that um, happen pretty close to, you know, where the naval stations are and where the ships dock and things like that. So you have areas like the, the Tenderloin and North Beach, which were not too far from where ships would dock. So I think a lot of these towns that have um, sailors and naval histories and military histories tend to have a fairly um, documented early bar scene and queer space scene and things like that. I mean, I, I think we see the same things in, uh, for example, New York and San Francisco and San Diego and a lot of um, cities where there's a lot of sailors and shipping and travelers and things like that, because it's a lot easier to express yourself sexually, um, you know, at, at some place where the ship is docking versus your your hometown in Iowa or wherever. That is very true. And I've heard that story many times from from people in different cities. Um, now, you were talking about the segregation and division in the gay bar scene mid-century. Um, my research kind of indicates that that started to dissolve in a number of cities across the country with the advent of the disco era in the early to mid 70s, uh, where those big disco clubs and dance bars were really attracting not only the artsy crowd, the gay crowd, lesbians, people of color, you know, it was kind of a melting pot. And that seems to be kind of when the gay bar scene became a little more integrated um, across the country. Did that happen in San Francisco also? Did the the impact of the of the disco scene kind of dissolve some of that, you know, strictly men, strictly women, strictly black division that you were seeing in the in the bar scene? You know, we have two African American interview subjects in the film. Uh, we have Jay Whitaker and Guy Clark, and both of them talk about the racism that was uh, prevalent in San Francisco. Um, uh, Jay Whitaker and Janis Joplin couldn't get an apartment together in the Polk, which at the time was a big gay neighborhood, but it wasn't friendly to African-American or mixed couples. Uh, and Guy Clark talks about the racism that happened in, in the Castro and how uh, bar owners wouldn't employ black bartenders. And um, all of this, this racism in San Francisco and in the Castro is, is very well documented and really continues a lot longer than we would like it, of course. Um, the question about these sort of uh, 1970s discos and things like that, um, you know, San Francisco was home to Sylvester and uh, Patrick Cowley and a lot of people working in the high energy movement. And there were a lot of clubs and discos uh, that were happening. Um, we had uh, the I-Beam in the hate and uh, of course um, the rendezvous, which is in the Tenderloin that Jim Van Buskirk talks about. And, um, uh, but San Francisco is still a pretty small town. So San Francisco doesn't really have, or at least at the time, these sort of giant mega discos that you find in, for example, New York, like Studio 54. And um, 
I think that what you're saying, you know, may be correct. Um, that the influence of disco helped bring in a broader sense of community and more people, more diversity together. But, but I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think that it is, it is interesting that disco and R and B and soul really appealed to a lot of gay people and gay people were always involved in, in those musics and rock and roll and things like that. And there's a lot of people who are very important in, in pushing boundaries musically um, as well as culturally. Um, but, I, you know, it, it, it's hard to speak about, um, about racism in the disco scene versus, you know, anti-racism in the disco scene. I think without, I, I think maybe researching a, a little bit more. I, I think I'm sort of reticent to give kind of like a, a, a glib commentary on that. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, interest in, in um, San Francisco's contribution to disco culture and high energy culture and Patrick Cowley and Sylvester and things like that and how they broke on to the national scene with some huge hit songs and the disco movement was tremendously important and faced a huge backlash you know the the disco sucks movement which a lot of people uh, have written about as well so after having explored the history of the gay bar scene throughout san francisco what do you feel is the significance of that bar scene to how the gay community developed, how it evolved and became what it is today? I, I think that's a great question. I think it's really powerful to sort of contextualize uh, these gathering spots, not just the bars, but also the bathhouses, the bookstores, the record stores, the restaurants, and to sort of look at the way culture has evolved and is evolving I mean there's been this big resurgence of interest in the history of gay bars by people such as yourself and also Derek Servini and there's this book that just came out gay bar by Jeremy Atherton Lynn so there's a lot of people now looking at gay bars and I suspect one of the reasons for this is that our culture has shifted so much um, with the internet and now with the apps that gay bars and restaurants and bathhouses and clubs and things like that have really sort of changed the way that they function so that they used to be this place where you could you know trick and hook up and meet people and they're becoming a lot more restaurant like in terms of they're places where you go with your friends. So you wouldn't walk up and talk to strangers at a restaurant. And I, my sense is that this is sort of where a lot of bars have evolved to, where it's, you have uh, fewer cruising bars and more bars that are sort of operating in this social space of you go there with your friends, where there's straight women having a bachelorette party or something like that and it's less of a sexual space. Um, and I think a lot of that sexual socialization, which is very important, has moved to online spaces and apps and mobile phones and things like that. And I think there's this big interest in mid-century bar culture now because it represents a different way of meeting people where you could actually see in person what you were gonna get. And you could get a sense of people in person and really size them up and hear them and smell them and understand how they moved and what their vibe was. And I think that apps have really alighted that culture and they've sort of hidden a lot of those um, interpersonal human aspects. I think you're absolutely correct on that. I, um, you know, when I started this project and I named it Gay Archives, um, I got a little bit of backlash from some people for a couple of reasons. One was the use of the word gay, 
because people are saying, well, what about LGBTQIAP++? And my response to that was, when I was coming out, it was all gay. If you were lesbian, if you were trans, if you were a drag queen, whatever, it was the gay scene. It was gay pride. It was, it meant, you know, non-traditional, non-heterosexual, you know, outliers in the community. It did not mean gay the way people now want to interpret it as being, you know, men who like men. And um, so that was the first backlash I got was just using the word gay. And the other thing was about the archives, which, you know, as you mentioned, in even in my collection of, of bars and spaces that have, have gone, I've included bathhouses, I've included restaurants, I've included uh, even a couple of public spaces that were an integral part of the socialization for the gay community. It technically isn't a gay bar. They didn't serve alcohol or have a dance floor necessarily, but they were places where the community could connect, um, where there was socialization, where we had support for our political and personal beliefs, where we could live our, what we now call authentic lives that we couldn't do in public back then. You know, you could not walk out in the 1970s or 80s and tell your boss, whether you're working in retail or restaurant or corporate world and say, hey, this is my boyfriend, you know, that didn't fly. So generally speaking, we all wore a mask and the, the gay bar scene or gay socializing scene is where you could kind of let your hair down and be who you wanted to be, who you, you really were. Uh, so I did include a lot of those spaces in um, in my research, and I'm continuing to do so. Yeah, I, th I think I think um, I, I have a, a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, uh, Nick and a number of people I think uh, spoke about uh, places that were both bars and restaurants, and and used steak dinners as a loss leader to bring people in. So I think Nick talks about Gordon's. And there's another place uh, in South of Market where they would um, go for dinner because they would have these discount steak dinners, but that the, the, the establishment wasn't making money on these steak dinners. They were losing money probably on the steak dinners, but it was a way of bringing people into the establishment that would then make money on the alcohol. Right. Uh, another thing that I kind of would like to speak to is that uh, San Francisco is really well known for its trans community, and there's even a, a, a documentary film about Compton's where uh, they, there was a big trans riot at Compton's cafeteria in the Tenderloin, and that has a very uh, long and powerful history. And at the time we made the film, which was 2010, we filmed it starting in 2010, and then it was released in 2012, um, it's sort of like a very different time now. And now there's a lot more interest in trans history and trans visibility. And um, I'm sure we would have framed things a lot better. Um, but as far as the film was made at the time in 2010, we really you know, did our best to try to include these stories of women's bars and spaces that were appealed to a number of uh, you know, a variety of people. And I think um, uh, Jim Forat talks a little bit about uh, the terminology used about trans people and people that went to the stud nowadays, which of course that was filmed 2010. He was saying nowadays, uh, these people would be called trans and the sort of um, semantic um, issues we have. But I think, I think the film still does a good job in documenting the spaces and, and trying to point out who went there and we use the language that was in use at the time because we have that information from the archives and from this database. Um, so those bars are described using the language that was in use at the time. And I think we're always progressing and using better language and understanding more about gender and sexuality. Um, so as our 
understanding of gender and sexuality and history improves, we can better document um, what those spaces were, who was welcome, who was unwelcome, where people went, why they went there, and things like that. Um, I do think that it's very interesting that some bars, like the stud, being open became a hallmark of the stud, that it was known for being a place that anybody could go to. They welcomed women, they welcomed hippies, they welcomed heads, they welcomed leather folk, they welcomed gay men, they welcomed people that were ambiguous or were uh, trans or were somewhere on, on a spectrum of gender. They welcomed people who dressed in tie dye. They welcomed people who presented themselves in a female sort of manner. They welcomed all kinds of people. Whereas on the other hand, there were leather bars that often had rules about who could go there. You had to be a man, you had to wear leather, you had to present yourself in a certain kind of way. So there's a lot of bars, at least in San Francisco, because of the wide spectrum of communities and opportunities for self-presentation available, there's a wide number of bars that catered to different genders, um, backgrounds, and means of present, uh, presentation. You know, one of the things that's interesting about San Francisco is that there were also bars that um, catered towards, towards wealthier people. Like, for example, I think the Lions Pub, um, I'm not sure if that's in the film, but the Lions Pub was known for guys in suits and guys who had nice houses in Pacific Heights and made a lot of money and wore suits. Um, uh, you know, you had business band bars and things like that. So um, when you bring in issues of class, that adds another layer to it. And as I said, San Francisco is a particular case because there were so many bars. It's not like a, a small town in the Midwest where there's only one bar and everyone goes there. Um, San Francisco had a sort of stratified scene in terms of maybe stratified isn't the right word, but there's a, a great number of different places that catered to certain people. And some places, you know, like I think I mentioned Scott's Pit was a women's bar that wanted to keep the men out because they wanted it to be a certain kind of place for women. And we looked at also uh, the women's community on Valencia Street, which had a Cento and they had women's bookstores and women's bathhouses and women's bars and, and a sort of community around that. So after doing all this exploration and creating the film, documenting San Francisco's um, gay bar scene, what do you hope that viewers will learn from watching Submerged Queer Spaces? Well, I think Submerged Queer Spaces sits in this very interesting space because it's sort of an experimental documentary. It's sort of an art film. It's very much focused on architecture. And so some people are a little bit surprised by it because it's very much looking at architectural details and this kind of archeological approach of, hey, this place used to be here, what's left? Oh, the only thing that's left is this broken tile and this, these attachment points for the sign that used to be there. Um, so there's a certain amount of this nostalgia in there and a certain amount of discovery in there and um, you know, the other interesting thing about it is that now that it's been 10 years since the film was filmed and eight years since the film was released, the film is now a document of its own point in time. Because at the time we were making this film that was like, oh, look at these historical photographs and look at the way things are now. And now is now a decade ago. So San Francisco has changed so much again that you can watch this film and see, oh, wow, look at this place that it, how this was 10 years ago. It's no longer like that either. So it's sort of become this way station in the journey of change that San Francisco has been making. So as you just mentioned, it has been a roughly 10 years since you filmed the uh, filmed Submerged Queer Spaces. How do you think in general 
the San Francisco scene has changed since then. And what projections do you have for the future? Will there be a follow-up? Will there be another submerged queer spaces or what does the future hold? Yeah, you know, th this, this film, we started filming this film uh, the year that I left San Francisco. So um, we started filming in 2010 when I was still living in San Francisco. And that was also the year that I left San Francisco. And San Francisco continues to change. I mean, I think it's no secret that it's sort of become this tech hotspot. It's become very expensive. And um, I think that, or I hope that the film has made some small contribution to people's interest in architectural history and urban archeology span and queer history. And that people such as yourself are continuing to do this work to make archives or make other films or do a, maybe um, a podcast or a vlog or some other way of presenting queer history that people can engage with. Um, because, you know, history continues to need to be preserved. It's not like you preserve it and it's done, you know, oh, well, someone wrote this guidebook in 1970, so we're done. No, it's not like that. Uh, uh, the queer community continues to develop. San Francisco continues to develop. We continually get new perspectives on the past, new ways of looking at the past. So I think it's, it's all part of a process. Um, and I hope that having the film be available now because people can watch it either through the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center or through Amazon Prime Video. People can, people can still access it, which is really, really good. Um, and that's one of the good things about the internet and all that is that, is that it helps us to access things that previously would sort of, um, you know, fall by the wayside. So hopefully it can be part of this continuing, uh, documentation of the queer community. Well, I was, I was so impressed with the way that you approached the topic and the depth that you went into uh, in exploring San Francisco's gay history with submerged queer spaces that the other day I was having a conversation with a gentleman. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's a prominent uh, gay historian in New Orleans by the name of Frank Perez. And he does walking tours of the, um, the French Quarter and teaches about history and gay history. And he's a member of the, um, the LGBTQ archives of Louisiana. He's in, very involved in historical preservation of uh, the gay scene and gay information in New Orleans. And I actually suggested to him... I not only sent him a link to watch the movie, but suggested that New Orleans would be an excellent place to replicate what you've done. Because like San Francisco, New Orleans has a long history and, you know, a lot of architecture that is relevant while you're, you're dealing with a smaller neighborhood. You know, the French Quarter is not very big, but I think your project could easily be taken to numerous other cities. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, New York City for one, probably Chicago, um, you know, a number of different cities that Washington, D.C., that have an, a really interesting connection between the architecture and the history of, of their, their gay scene that would apply perfectly to what you've already done. So I hope that maybe somehow you and Frank and whoever else can kind of collaborate on doing a you know, a similar project in another city. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that that people are interested in this kind of thing. And I think it would be really easy for people to do this kind of film for their own city and, and probably do it a lot better because they can see everything that works in submerged queer spaces and they can see everything that doesn't work in submerged queer spaces. You know, there's a lot of things that audiences like seeing. They really like seeing people talking and they really like seeing pictures. Um, 
of of people and uh, I think you know there's there'd be ways to do this type of film for other cities and to do it a lot better and to make the stories you know come to life you could do enacts reenactments of events um, there was I think a documentary about um, about a bar in New Orleans that had a tragic fire yes uh, Yes, um, very sad story. But I think there was a whole documentary film about that. Very, there is. It's called the Upstairs Lounge. Right. Name of the bar, and the same guy also did another um, documentary on the Rainbow Lounge raid in Fort Worth, Texas, um, which is kind of an anomaly because we think of bar raids, as you know from your exploration of mid-century gay scenes we think of bar raids as being something of the 50s 60s 70s where police would come in and basically detain everybody in the bar and look for excuses to arrest them but um the rainbow lounge event occurred um in i th think 2009 or something um in fort worth texas and was the same kind of scene where they went in and they basically tried to arrest everybody and charge them with indecent acts or whatever they could come up with. A uh, number of the people involved in that ended up getting substantial settlements from the city, but um, it just goes to show that history does repeat itself. And just because we think of Stonewall as being 50 years ago uh, does not mean that it can't happen again. So. Yeah, I, I think there's, I think that there's a lot of stories that come out of these spaces um oh the screaming queens is the name of the documentary about the compton's cafeteria um, but you know there's a lot of nostalgia around these spaces and there's a lot of history around these spaces and, and that's another really good approach is to find a space that's very historic and to really dial down and tell the story of that space so i mean there's a lot of great opportunities for filmmakers to do to do work in this area i think yeah, without even leaving their hometown. If they live in a in a city that has some some gay history, they could do it right at home. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. So your professional career, you know, we've been talking about this particular movie and whatever, but you're a prolific composer, author, filmmaker, educator. You've done all kinds of things. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, about the man behind the movie? <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I've done a lot of things, I guess. I mean, I started working in the recording industry in Los Angeles in the 1980s. Um, I moved up to San Francisco in about 1991. Um, I worked at Pixar for a while. Um, you know, I went to conservatory, I, I'm a, a trained musician. So I've written a lot of music. Um, I taught at a music college in the Midwest for two years. Um, I'm now working as a music editor in Los Angeles. Um, I've written two books. So, um, and made one documentary feature film, uh, Submerged Queer Spaces. So yeah, I mean, I've sort of uh, flailed around quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> a jack of all trades, so to speak. Um, is there a single gay bar from the past that holds a particularly special place in your heart? And if so, what is that? Yeah, you know, uh, there's a number of uh, gay bars uh, that hold special places in, in my heart. Um, I, I sort of came out when I was um, in Los Angeles and uh, after the Odyssey closed, there was uh, Studio One, which had this night on Thursday nights called M and M Night, which stood for um, Men and Music, but it was an underage night, uh, under twenty one. And of course, I mean, I I was under twenty one, but I had a fake ID. Like every, every self respecting you know gay boy had a fake ID back then, because back then you, you could have a fake ID. But in any case, um, just because that was sort of my age demographic, I really enjoyed Thursday nights at Studio One in um, Los Angeles. Uh, much later when I lived in San Francisco, um, I lived very close to the Eagle. 
the eagle is in submerged queer spaces and um, the eagle was very well known for its Sunday beer busts. And so it was really great that I could just walk to the eagle um, every Sunday for the beer bust. Um, and there's a lot of other bars, I think, um, internationally that have just really impressed me. Uh, Tom's bar in Berlin, uh, where I lived for one summer was just, it was just very friendly. And, um, you know, people would be stuck up in all these other bars, but people would always come and talk to you at Tom's bar. Um, in New York, I lived in the Lower East Side. And, and um, I think my one of my favorite bars was the Cock. Um, they had great nightclubs in New York, too. Um, I lived in Minnesota for, for two years. And I think, you know, one of the bars that I liked there was Bar 19 because it was so neighborhoody was one of the few really neighborhoody bars I felt that was was really welcoming. Um, and, um, you know, there's just so many when you think of these these bars, because I mean, I think, you know, at a certain point in your life, you go out a lot because, you know, you're trying to meet people and that's what you do. Right. And that's the, you know, this whole project started for me that way. I started um, doing a commemorative design for one of my favorite Atlanta bars, which was called Backstreet. And um, the next couple of months, I started talking to friends, you know, you reminisce about like you were just talking about, well, I remember this bar and I remember this bar. And I started documenting a handful of them. And then when COVID hit, I suddenly found myself with more time at home and less places to go. You really couldn't go out to eat dinner and you didn't go out and hang out in public anywhere. And I really dove into this project and um, I get more and more encouragement from, you know, people on social media um, or comments to my website that um, people are, you know, constantly saying, well, thank you so much for doing this. And um, I really appreciate you bringing back those memories or encouraging. I have a Facebook group I started a few months ago that has about 1200 members now and people are constantly posting in there pictures of them when they were a bartender in 1984 or a matchbook cover from a bar that they went to in the seventies or whatever. And the number of reactions and comments that I see on those kind of posts is telling me that there are people out there that really want to relive that history. Just like your grandmother had memories of her childhood that she would talk about, you know, when you were sitting on her lap, uh, it's the same way. Now we want to talk about our history. And one thing that inspired me to, to really kind of embrace this concept is that so much of our gay history that's documented in the mainstream world focuses on riots and uprisings, political figures, legislation, things that mean something to us, but don't really bring back those warm and fuzzy feelings necessarily. It's yeah, you know what? I, I just remembered another, there's also a feature documentary about Jules Catch One in Los Angeles, yes. which is a very famous, um, you know, giant uh, disco that I, I went to in the very early nineties, late eighties, early nineties. And it had a largely, african-american following and that was a lot of fun too that place was great um, and there's a there, there now that i'm thinking about it, there's another couple bars that i'd like to give an, a shout out to which is um the boom boom room in laguna beach when laguna beach was like a little gay kind of hangout uh, that that place was amazing and um ripples in long beach which oh is, yeah which is the from what i'm told is the last gay bar on the ocean on the Pacific Rim is closing, has closed, or it's closing, I don't know. I believe it has closed. Yeah, very, very, very sad. Um, I guess I always thought more people would leap to its defense, but, um, you know, a, a, a fewer people are going out. I think it goes back to, you know, what you were saying or asking about earlier about the, the changing demographic and our changing world is that fewer people are just going out because it's all there on your phone. So why go out when you can just open your phone and check the apps? 
I think that's part of it. And I think also part of it is, um, you know, back when I was coming out, um, if you were going out with a group of friends or if you were going out with a boyfriend or, you know, potential date or whatever, um, you were more selective about going to businesses that embraced your lifestyle. You went to look for those, those restaurants and, and bars and things that were very gay friendly. And so you ended up interacting a lot more with the same people because instead of having 800 restaurants to choose from in San Francisco, you might've had 20. And those were the ones that you went to regularly. That's where you kept going on a date or going out for dinner every Tuesday night or whatever. But nowadays I see the younger people, the people that are in their twenties and their thirties, they don't care. They'll go anywhere. They'll go to Chili's or Applebee's or Fridays or because they, nobody's going to, it's not really going to be an issue. So, and they also tend, I think, from my experience anyway, um, when I was in my 20s, my social circle, I'd say 90% of it was gay white male. When I went out, if I was going out to dinner, four or five of us, all white males, just by virtue of where I was living and what the scene was like. And now you see these guys that are, you know, just out of high school or whatever, and they're going out with, they have a lesbian friend and a, you know, a black friend and a um, Latino friend and whatever. And it's like a melange. It's a mixed group and they don't really feel like they have to go to a gay bar or a gay restaurant. They go wherever they feel like going and it just kind of, nobody even looks twice. I, I think that, I mean, I think that some of the things you're talking about are, 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 are very healthy. I think that the increased diversity of our community is is really healthy. Um, one of the things that I sort of worry about is as queer culture becomes mainstreamed is that people are sort of looking towards this sort of mass marketed mainstreamed queer culture as definition of who they are rather than looking within themselves and the people around them. So I think that's another interesting aspect of um, you know, queer bars and queer architecture and queer community is where people mix, how people mix, and just the free flow of information about um, you know, who they are and what they can do and and, and things like that. Um, I may not be expressing myself very, very well here, um, but I, I think that a lot of the, uh, the gay bar scene that you are documenting relates to a time when there weren't really a lot of queer friendly images on um, mainstream media. But at the same time as mainstream media tends to project more, um, queer community it's also selects what it projects and it tends to you know project a very safe patriarchal kind of image of of queerness rather than radical queerness and people who really want to um, change society so i think that's an, another thing to consider but by the same token a lot of queer bars i mean they weren't trying to be activist spaces either they were just trying to sell alcohol so right. um a lot of the queer community really developed even more you know through act up and queer nation and protests and that community is very important too and that relates back to of course the screaming queens compton's cafeteria documentary and the way activism um took hold in various spaces um, because activists made it so. Um. And I think the AIDS uh, crisis kind of added fuel to the fire and unified a lot of those activist type mu movements because there was a common cause that was a major threat to the community. So I think that made a big difference too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, people are going to be nostalgic over 
bars because they had a good time at the bar. They're not going to be nostalgic over the hospice. Right. Um, but that's still part of the story. And there's a lot of really powerful documentaries being made made about that. Um, there, there's a documentary, I forget the name, but it's, it's about um, this um, AIDS ward at the San Francisco General Hospital. And the name escapes me, but that's a very powerful piece of filmmaking. Yeah, and you know, I think you... As we tell these stories, we're trying to figure out what is the story that we want to tell and how are we going to tell it? And with Submerged Queer Spaces, this the film is almost an art history film because we were really looking a lot of the architecture and not necessarily everything that happened in those spaces, some of which are happy stories, some, some of which are not. Um, the film is almost like an art history film, I think. Yeah, and it's great that we're, you know, we're all investing some time and effort in preserving this history. And I think it's very important that anyone who's involved in doing any type of gay history projects kind of feel like they're working together instead of competing. You know, I'm not trying to compete with what you did with the San Francisco movie. Um, you're not trying to compete with the guy in New Orleans who's doing walking tours of the of the French Quarter. We're all trying to bring the same basic issue to light. And that's part of the reason I started doing this uh, series was because I can reach out and talk to people around the country or around the world and capture bits and pieces. But at the end of you know this hour session or whatever, they have more references to look at. They can go look at your website. They can go look at your movie. They can go look at you know the resources that you've put together and none of us can do it all. Yeah, so. there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And there's also not that many professional historians doing this work. I mean, there's Dr. Right. Eric Trevini who wrote The Deviant's War. There's Dr. Susan Stryker, who's written a number of books, but there's also a huge place for you know queers in the community to document themselves. Um, and eventually that becomes an important resource as well. Um, and people can always volunteer for archives. There's more and more queer archives. There's more and more university archives that are archiving um, queer collections. Um, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Northridge all have queer collections in special collections and unique collections. And, you know, they always need donations or archivists or people helping. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for people to do stuff. And e even what you're doing is really great too, interviewing people and documenting their recollections. And it it's all important work and there's a, a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. And, you know, just in my last 12 months of researching these places that have gone out of business um, over the decades, I've already come up with over 1,300 in the U.S., which I thought was a pretty daunting figure until I was speaking to an archivist in um, Chicago. And while they aren't going into as great a detail with necessarily the specifics of the history or finding the old ads, but more so just documenting the existence, they have come up with a list of over 700 queer spaces in Chicago over the years, 700 in one city. Yeah, no, I, I believe that that's, that's like what the database that we looked at in San Francisco was like. So uh, the archive had this database with all these places and all this information. Um, and they also had um, this collection of archival photographs that we were given permission to use for the film. And of course, what we did was we used the places that had photographs. Right. Um, in some cases, there were places that we didn't have photographs of, uh, which was very unfortunate, but we had to include anyway. So for example, the Black Cat, which is a very famous bar in North Beach, there were no archival photographs of the Black Cat and that we could access. And so we ended up including it anyway. We just didn't have an archival photograph to do a match cut to. And also the black cat was another place where the address didn't match the building anymore. 
So we had no archival picture. We had an address that didn't make any sense. And we had to do all this work to figure out where the black cat was. And we eventually figured it out and it's in the film. Um, but that required a, a pretty fair amount of sleuthing, which was a little bit of a surprise because this is one of the most famous gay bars in San Francisco. How could we not have a picture and how could we not figure out where it was? I mean, we eventually figured it out, but it was, it was an unexpected challenge. Um, so there's a lot of places in the film that are in there because we had a photograph and because we had information. And there was a lot that got left out just because we didn't have a photograph, we didn't have information. And, and the film is already pretty long. The film is actually a hundred minutes. And when we did a screening at Frameline with the, the world premiere, you know, we thought, oh gosh, people are going to sit through this 100 minute film. And at the end, we had a Q and A and people were asking, why didn't you have this bar? Why didn't you have that bar? Why didn't you have that bar? And it's like, isn't the film long enough? So a lot of it is, you know, at least with a film, you have to make some choices, but also a, a, a lot of the stuff we didn't necessarily have pictures of and when it was harder to document and harder to include in a film if you don't have any visual images. Yeah, I'm familiar with that concept. I probably have um, a smattering of information on probably another 1500 bars that I have not included in the archives yet because I haven't found old ads. I can't confirm the exact address or, you know, I don't have any imagery of their logo or pictures of their building. I just have a mention somewhere that, you know, somebody went there and it was a gay place. And so I have another list of all these places that will eventually make it when I find the right people who have the right memories uh, to share the information with me so I can include them because that's a big problem when you're going back in history. This We're talking about things from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Nobody walked around with cameras in their pocket. Oh, you know, you know that, that, that's another thing I, I, I would like to, or I can speak to briefly is that um, a lot of the bars that we have in the film, we're only using exteriors. And there's a reason for that. It was unacceptable to even bring a camera inside a gay bar at the time, let alone use a camera inside a gay bar at the time. You, I mean, it was not welcome because even if people weren't closeted, there was this notion of the gay bars being a private space and a safe space and you weren't going to be photographed. So all the pictures we have, they're all exteriors, I think. There's very few bars um, that have interior photographs that still exist. Right. Now, a lot of people don't realize, I'm sure it was the same way in San Francisco, but up until probably the mid 80s uh, or possibly later in some places, most gay bars did not have any visibility from the street into the bar. The windows were painted black or boarded over. The entrance was at the rear. So you didn't, you know, driving by, couldn't look and see what was there. Um, you know, there was no awareness it's only in the recent couple of decades that we've started to put big picture windows and huge neon signs and say hey here we are the bars that adopted glass windows and large open entryways tell this story about how gay lesbian transgender bisexual people became more open in who they were and about being seen in public Thank you, Jack, for sharing your stories and a little bit of the history of the San Francisco gay scene. And that concludes another segment of the Gay Barchives podcast. You can find more podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. We also have more information about this podcast and links to the other podcasts we have completed. We hope you enjoy your trip down memory lane.